Hello and welcome to a chisma. Chess. In this video, I am going to teach you to win by playing one pawn to d4. More specifically, I'm going to teach you an opening system called the Queen's Gambit. And this is just a great opening system. It is my main weapon as white. And it's very, very good for newcomers because in many, many cases you get to play the exact same setup. You get to develop all your pieces according to the same plan, game after game after game. So you can build experience, and you can build intuition, and you can learn how to really crush your opponents with this excellent opening. This video is sponsored by Babbel, the number one app for learning a new language. As you may know, I'm currently learning German and I've actually gotten to the point where I can read German books just for pleasure. I'm currently reading Momo oder die seltsame Geschichte von den Zeitdieben und von dem Kind, das den Menschen die stohlene Zeit zurückbrachte. As you can hear, I'm getting more and more confident in my pronunciation, thanks to Babbel. When I want to relax, I listen to their podcast called Speaking of Berlin while reading along the transcript to slowly but surely let the language seep into my brain. If you also want to join, you can get 65% off. That is less than $5 a month to learn a new language. Just click the link in the description to claim the offer. Technically, the Queen's Gambit arises after black responds with pawn to d5, a symmetrical move, and you play the explosive move, pawn to c4. And this little thing here, this is the Queen's Gambit. But I'm actually going to take black's move back here because for the first part of the video I'm not going to be concerned really with what black plays and that's because I want you to really understand where do you want to put your pieces and why in the Queen's Gambit every piece has a job and you are the general you are the manager, you are the leader, and your job is to know what everybody should be doing and help them get to a point where they can do that well. So let's first give you a very solid understanding of what you want all of these guys to do for you. Then, when you have a fundamental understanding of what the opening trying to do then I will show you an example game where I played as white I played the Queen's Gambit and my opponent was a decent chess player about 1800 1900 in rating and she played a fine game but one that didn't challenge the Queen's Gambit opening so you will see the ideas unfold, you will see in the example game what the opening is really trying to do in a practical game. So you open up the game with pawn to d4. This is one of two big moves in chess. This is uh, the queen's pawn and the other very big opening move is the king's pawn. And these two are very, very 
very different. The King's Pawn is best by test, Fisher said, but the Queen's Pawn has won a lot in popularity since the 70s and it has actually been played for hundreds of years. But uh, Fischer played e4 throughout his career and then in his world championship match against Spassky he played d4 and said okay maybe this was not the best move and then he completely surprised Spassky and played some uh, beautiful beautiful games and won that world championship match very convincingly. The same strategy of course was echoed in the Queen's Gambit uh, Netflix series where Elizabeth Harmon plays E4, the King's Pawn, throughout her career until the final game where she plays D4. It's an homage to Fisher. Why would you play this move? So this move and E4 they have one thing in common. They take control of two squares in the center of the board. In that regard, they are completely equal. So what's the difference? Why would you prefer one move over the other? The difference is that with e4, the pawn is not protected. While with d4, the pawn is protected by the queen. Okay? So, isn't this move just strictly better? Well, not strictly better, because with e4, you're opening up for the good light square bishop. You can have quick attacks on f7, and the queen can come out also very quickly this diagonal. Whereas with d4, and I know we are going very deep here, but uh, that's that's how chess really should be taught, you know, because you need to understand really the fundamental, you need to understand why we are doing what we are doing. There's no use in just uh, trying to <laughs> learn like a million moves by heart, 99.99% uh, of people can't do that. You need to understand what's going on and why you do what you do. So with d4, this bishop can come out similar to this bishop. This bishop is a little less strong because this bishop cannot attack f7 and f7 is the weakest point that black has. So in the opening of the game, the light square bishop is a little stronger than the dark square bishop. And also, you can't really de develop the queen uh, effectively in the same way. Because you don't want to be doing this, developing it like this. It's not, uh, I'm not going to get too deep into that, but that's not a, that's not a particularly effective way of developing the queen. So... What you are really, on the most fundamental level, what you are really saying when you play 1d4 is that you prefer a little bit of security, a little bit of safety over attacking chances. So you have a little bit more attacking chances with e4 and you have a little, a little bit of a more safe game with d4 the queen's pawn uh, you have a little bit uh, you have a higher likelihood also of getting to a known position because uh, it's harder for black to mess with you when you play d4 so that is the point you attack center squares in a safe way where you can play to your strengths and your opening strategy Now, I was once uh, having a beer. This is, you know, this is what I'm not trying to flex or something, anything, but I was having a beer with an actual chess grandmaster, a 
Danish guy that I happened uh, to meet. And uh, I asked him, you know, if, if you could play any two moves for white, instead of only one move, what would you play? And I hoped that he would say something that would really improve my understanding of chess. Um, and what he said was a little deeper than I first gave it credit for. He said he would play this, which was kind of what I expected. Uh, but it's, it's quite deep, because this, if you, if you are able to start the game like this, you actually have a huge, huge advantage. Because look how many squares in your opponent's camp you are attacking. And what's also going on is that you... The, the squares that you are attacking, the four squares that you are attacking, they are in the center of the board. And that means that if black wants to get from one part of the board to some other part of the board, uh, he has to go around the center. So you really control like the central uh, station in a city or something like that. It's uh, You really control the flow of the game if you control the center. Control the spice, control the universe, control the center, control the chess game. So, when you play 1d4, you are of course hoping to play 1e4, or uh, you are hoping to play 2e4. And black is going to have all kinds of different uh, opening strategies they will hit you with, and they almost all have in common that they are trying to not allow you to play e4. And that's why you, on the second move, play c4 instead. So you really wanted to play d4 and e4. That would be really nice. But you can't get that. Black is not allowing you to. So you get the next best thing, which is c4. So now you control these four squares, which is also very, very good but slightly worse than controlling these four squares. The C4 pawn is explosive and it has the advantage of being C4, a demolition guy, that um, you can lose this guy, you can trade him, you can sacrifice him, you can gambit him in many, many situations, and it's okay, whereas the D and the E pawns are more valuable to you. So this guy is more expendable and you can explode him at will when you feel when you feel it's right for you. And this opening is very it's a very classical opening in the sense that it really focuses on fundamental chess principles, especially control of the center, control the spice, control the universe, control the center, control the chess game. So, I don't know if you know this, but the first pieces you should be looking to develop are the knights. Knights before bishops and everything before rooks. Okay. So you want to develop this knight to c3 and it's important that you play c4 before you develop this guy so you don't have it trapped so now this pawn can move so first c4 and then the c knight and after the c knight you want to develop the other knight and if you look at what these knights can really do you see this knight can go here and here the two dark squares in the center, and this knight can go here and here. So between them, they control the four center squares. So you're really playing this uh, fundamental strategy of chess of controlling the center. I cannot 
emphasize that enough. Let's, uh, let's just take a second to appreciate the rain on the window. I have had this in uh, heaven, in other videos, and people in the comments seem to believe that it was a sound effect. Then it isn't. It really, it's really just raining on the window. Okay, so now you have to figure out what to do with the bishops. And I actually often play this bishop out before I develop the light square bishop. But I'm not going to recommend that. Uh, and I'll explain why. I'll, I'll recommend that you play e3. Now why not e4? Well, it's because in this uh, artificial setup that I'm doing, black hasn't moved. If you were able to play e4, then that would be really good. But in 9 out of 10 games, black is really making sure that you can't just play e4. So you play the next best thing, which is e3. And then you want to put your bishop here on d3. And a quick little note about developing this bishop. You, depending on what it black is doing, you may, you know, play e3 later or not later than putting this bishop out. Of course, that's impossible. But the move order, you know, you can adapt the move order in what, how you respond to what black is doing. If it is the case that black has a pawn on d5, this will happen a lot of the time. Let you would try. You would be looking to see if you can get black to first capture on c4, so that you can recapture like this, and then later go back to d3, where you really want to be in many cases. And this is because this is just a small wrinkle, but it's, you know, it has to do with the role, the job, and the ideas connected to the light squared bishop in the queen's gambit setup. What, what will very often happen is you'll play bishop to d3, then they capture, and then you recapture. And that means that the whole move you played bishop to d3 is wasted because they made you move it again. So you lost what we in chess call a tempo, right? We call that a tempo, you lost a tempo. It's not the end of the world, this is going to happen a lot of times, but try to see if you can wait, you know, don't put it out immediately if you have something uh, else productive to do. It's just a small little detail there. Absolutely not the end of the world if you have to move the bishop more than once and you lose the tempi, that's okay. But you want to put it on d3. And this is the first time where you develop a piece that is really showing the aggressive ideas in the queen's gambit. So the knights and the pawns, they are about center they are controlling the center so that you can dictate the pace of the game so that you won't be attacked ferociously because you will have just a very solid uh, defense set up and you can control the flow of the game and um, so that your opponent will not get on your side of the board you know this is your front line and it's Make sure that your opponent will not, you know, cram you and get all up in your face. This guy is not really about the center in the same way, of course.
pause. He is attacking e4, helping you play this pawn forward later, which is what this guy wants to do. This is uh, a Drake pawn, like uh, in, uh, in the Sicilian defense, if you watched the Sicilian defense video. There also is a Drake pawn. A uh, drake pawn and the drake pawn you know it starts from the bottom but it wants to go to the top this guy is aggressive he's looking at black's king side and when we start looking at the different opening systems that black can try to hit you with you'll see that black will almost always castle to the king side that means the king will be here and that means that this guy is attacking the castle and he's actually going to work uh, together with the queen I'm going to show you that in a little bit um, after moving this bishop out the most common move order and what I'm going to uh, recommend is to castle and it's just for beginners I just recommend you know get castled quite quickly um, because it's just so much harder to checkmate you when you have your king castled and when it's hard to checkmate you then you have more time to execute your plans you can also uh, play the next move queen to c2 before castling depends on the position depend one depends on what black is doing okay but uh, why are you castling to this side of the board well when you have castled to the king side your king is very safe he's behind these three pawns and you can contrast these three pawns with these three pawns in the middle this is a unit this is a unit we'll actually talk about the last unit uh, later in the video this unit is your front line these are your foot soldiers they are the front line you use them to control the center you use them to attack this unit let's call it the uh, C unit so you'll have the A unit the B unit and the C unit the C unit they are a living wall operation human shield <laughs> uh, they are a wall to the castle okay the castle has a tower the castle has a knight defending it ward of the castle it has a king inside the castle and it has a wall and this is just to protect your king so don't go out with these pawns too early and don't do it unless you have a very clear plan of why you're doing it okay because they are a wall and what you really want to be doing with these guys is just to keep them back until you need a particular setup to defend so maybe there is a knight here that could be uh, harassing you maybe there is a situation where let's say this and you really need this bishop, uh, this knight to move. You have some plan you want to go here, and there's some plan you want to you want to execute. And then you want to be able to say, okay, I'll use the living wall now to kick this knight away, because because otherwise, of course, if you move the, move this guy, this is no longer attacked or defended. The knight is defending this guy then uh, you are faced with checkmate and therefore before you want to move this you kick this guy away he moves and now you can move okay so that um, that is that is the goal of this wall you, you keep it back until you find out okay what formation works against the thing that black is specifically uh, threatening me with sometimes it's this move you need to play and that depends on what black is doing okay 
So unit C is the living wall. And then actually a lot of times before we even develop the dark squared bishop, we develop the queen. And the queen in the queen's gambit, most of the time, you will put her on C2. So the queen, that is, you know, the best piece on the board. And you want to be aggressive with the queen. In the queen's gambit, uh, your queen has two main uh, soldiers under her command. And that those are the bishop, the light squared bishop, and the king's knight. These guys, in so many, so, so many games, you will get an attack like this with the knight and some bishop capturing something here, checking a king that will be here. We're going to look at that in some examples later. But uh, she is aggressive here on this diagonal. Um, of course, she can do a lot of other stuff, but that is her primary uh, function in the, the queen's gambit. And now we have to address the elephant in the room. The elephant is this guy, the dark squared bishop. And if you don't know uh, the like one of the best tips in chess, if you don't know what to do, if you don't know uh, how to come up with a plan in some position, what you do is you talk to your pieces, okay? And let's talk to these guys. Okay, we talk to unit uh, B here. And they are just chilling, they're having a great time. Uh, they are really fulfilling their life's purpose. <laughs> the same with the knights, they feel nice. Bishop, queen, they, f they feel nice. They are doing something that is accordance with, uh, with their job description. The king feels safe. This wall is, you know, intact and ready to react. Keep the wall intact and ready to react. That should be a, that should be a chess advice. Keep the wall intact and ready to react. But if you talk to this guy, though, he's a little depressed. He would like to, you know, also be attacking the king. He would like to also take control of the center. You know, he would like to be in the game. Why is he not in the game? It's because of this guy. You know, he can't get out. And that is why, uh, in some variations, you put this guy out before you play E3. Put him here or here before you play E3. But I'm not going to recommend that actually. This guy is what we know is uh, he's known as a bad bishop. This guy is what is known as a bad bishop. Okay? And that's because he is trapped behind his own pawns. Whereas this guy is a good bishop. You know, he can roam freely here. So you have the good bishop and the bad bishop. And you want to make this guy better. And here we come to one of the fundamental ideas in the Queen's Gambit. And that is to find a way to counter what black has been doing that is preventing you from playing e4 and then playing e4 so that you can get out with the bishop. And then you are most often going to either put it here, we'll very often attack a knight that will be there, or you will put it here uh, where you are looking at c uh, c7 and you are looking at the center of black's uh, side of the board and that is one way to get the bishop out so and I'll get into the whole thing of playing e3 to e4 uh, later I just 
just like to add that if you can't find a way to play this move, then there is the sneaky other way where you play b3 and put the guy here. This is also a very good diagonal for the bishop to be on. It's the longest possible diagonal he can be on. And um, this is a very good alternative. Let's say that is what you are doing. And here uh, you have the question then. What about the rooks? What role are they going to play? Well, one of the rooks is a tower. It is a tower in the castle. And therefore it already has a job description. It is already doing something. So, you may need it, you probably will need it to attack at some later point, but you start with the other one, the unemployed rook. Okay, so the unemployed rook, you want to find out where on this back rank you want to put this rook. Where do you want to put this rook? Okay. And usually, actually, it will be on c1. How come the rook will be on c1? That is because that this pawn, the c4 pawn, will very often has been, will very often have left the board. And you want to put the rook on the open or semi-open file. A file is open if there are no pawns on it, and it is semi-open if only the opponent has a pawn on the file. So that means that you can get these guys out of the way when the position called for it, and the rook is a cannon lined up against your opposing army. And if it happens that it's the E3 pawn that is gone, then that is where you want to put the rook to put the rooks on the open files and if possible you want to make a battery of the rooks where they support each other so wherever this rook goes it is already defended okay and there you have it that is the job descriptions of every piece and every pawn on the white side in the queen's gambit system. Okay. Okay, now it's time to show an example game. So you can see how you can use this opening strategy in practice. So I had the white pieces and I played my favorite move, pawn to d4. Uh, my opponent was, I think, like 1850 or something, so actually quite a decent player. And she played uh, d5. And I went in for the gambit. I played the gambit queens. Gambit, pawn to c4, the explosive move. And she accepted, pawn takes, pawn on c4. Here, I played pawn to e3. This uh, solidifies my pawn on d4, and of course, we know it opens up the pawn, uh, the attack on the pawn from the bishop. My opponent played book move, knight f6, and I captured. And you see, I'm just going with the plan. I'm putting my pieces on the squares that they want to go to. My opponent played e6. And I just went ahead, developing my knight, knight to c3. This is looking at e4. I'm beginning to think about ways to be able to push this pawn to e4 and get in the break so I can get the bishop out in the most effective 
way. My opponent was not really into that, so she played bishop b4, pinning the knight. So now the knight is unable to move, so I cannot play this, because it will fall. This is quite normal. I just developed my f knight, knight f3, all according to plan. And here my opponent played knight to c6. This looks like just a perfectly logical move. You're developing yeah, your pieces, like you have three pieces developed, you're ready to castle. Um, but the problem here is positionally, strategically. The problem is that she's not really challenging my setup. Ideally, you would try to maybe play some c5 move or try to mess with my setup because against something like the queen's gambit you cannot just allow your opponent to do everything they want. If you get the perfect queen's gambit position, if it's not challenged, well, you will see in this game just how deadly the queen's gambit really is. I castled. This is a move I always want to play anyway. And my opponent thought, okay, now this knight is no longer pinned, so I should chop it off. Bishop takes knight before it's able to move. I, of course, recaptured. And you can see the problem with the way my opponent is playing. It looks okay. She was able to castle now. Doesn't look like doesn't look like a huge advantage to white. We are equal on material. Uh, but actually white is already doing very, very well. The decision here to capture with the bishop gave me uh, another defender of my D pawn, making it easier for me to play e4, and that is the, one of the absolute most important themes in this opening. It is, if you can play e4, well, you will see in this game just how deadly that can be. Okay, so I played bishop back to d3. So I am moving the same piece again, and you know the rule in the opening, if you want to move the same piece twice, you must have a good reason. What is my reason? Well, the bishop could look good on this diagonal, but in this opening, the bishop really feels at home on d3. It is attacking h7 here, being aggressive towards the king, and it is supporting e4, so that cannot be captured by this knight. And my opponent probably didn't my opponent probably didn't have too much experience playing against the Queen's Gambit. And maybe she just thought, you know, it's equal on material, my king looks safe, it's fine, I just need to develop my last I just need to develop my last piece. And I will have an absolutely fine equal position. So she played b6, thinking about fin chattering the bishop. And b6 is not doing anything against my threat, which is to play e4. And now you can see this bishop it has a way into the game all of a sudden. So this guy is actually active without even having moved. So I am gaining a lot of time here. She played bishop b7, and that is the last mistake. The game is over. And 
that is why I wanted to share this game. Because it looks like Black has played very sensible positional chess, but she has not challenged my queen's gambit setup. I have had a dream version of the queen's gambit setup. I have a pawn on c3 that is defending d4. I have played e4. I am ready to play um, e5. And um, my king is safe. My pieces are active. And I am far ahead in development because I was able to get my pieces active. I was able to get some of my pieces active without even moving them. So the queen and the bishop are already in the game uh, and they haven't moved. So I am ahead in tempo there. Here I play e5. This chases the knight. The knight goes to a seemingly active central square on d5. And here you just need to know one simple trick. It's called the Greek gift. And then you will win the game from this sort of picture perfect uh, ideal version of the Queen's Gambit opening. And the Greek gift is to sacrifice this bishop. Bishop takes h7 with check. And the point here is uh, that if black takes, black didn't take. Black played king h8. But if you take, I now have knight g5, check. Notice that the uh, bishop is already active in defending this, so the queen cannot come in and capture. And if you go back, I just play queen h5, and there's actually no good way to stop checkmate. And um, there are some variations, and I have made an entire video on this trick. It's called uh, the ch the trick that won me a hundred the trick that won me a hundred games of chess. It's on the channel. You can go check it out if you want to see some variations and how to uh, defeat black, no matter what black does in this situation. Um, so my opponent here did absolutely not want me. Uh, to get in with this checkmating attack. So she played king h8, um, not capturing the bishop. And if you look at the position here, you can see I have these three pawns. They are cutting the chessboard in half. And I have my active pieces, the knight, the queen, and the two bishops. They are on this half of the board. And unfortunately for my opponent, the king cannot get over to the other half. It cannot get into safety. Here, I play the same idea as if she had taken here. I play knight g5. And my idea is, it's the same pattern. You know, I just want to play queen h5, move the bishop, and checkmate. So my opponent plays g6. This is trying to trap the bishop. It's trying to give the king some escape square. And it is defending against queen coming here to h5. So I say, OK, I want to get my queen in. I can't go to h5. g4 instead. Very simple plan. I want to come here and then I want to execute the same checkmating idea. So my opponent tried to play king a g7 here, getting out of this file, getting ready to 
get the rook in trying to defend and here I just need to find the correct uh, attacking idea and I want to basically say okay my attack must crash through what is uh, preventing me basically it's just these pawns that's the only thing really that's between my forces and the king um, and I can sacrifice pieces here that's not a problem because uh, black's other pieces are not really participating in the attack so I won't I will only technically be down uh, piece I will only technically be down material but but in reality if my checkmating attack goes through then the extra pieces that black has they're not going to play a part so they might as well not be on the chessboard here I sacrifice the bishop bishop takes g6 the point is if she would have taken the bishop like so this pawn is no longer protected so knight takes e6 check and winning the queen with a royal fork if you want to have some fun you can try and figure out how to win if king takes bishop checkmate in a couple of moves uh, or you can just see what my opponent did so my opponent tried knight e7 attacking the bishop trying to get some pieces kind of desperately trying to get some pieces over here to to defend um, and this move doesn't work but in all fairness no moves are working i have actually had a winning advantage ever since i played e5 and i had a positional advantage almost from the start of the game um, from like move five i was already doing well because she wasn't really challenging my setup okay here i just played knight takes e6 and it's check and you can't really just move the king because you will lose the queen so she took then she actually resigned because she saw the forced checkmate i had but i'll show it so you'll see and how it's done and how you'll be able to execute it in your own games so i played bishop f5 this checks the king from the queen discovered check knight interposing doesn't do anything i just capture with the queen continuing the attack going to h8 check mate doesn't work so king f7 is the only try now i don't i can't checkmate like this it hangs the queen so i use a common trick I play the check from a distance. Queen h5 check. You're shutting the door. Can't go here. Um, if you go here, I have the same checkmate. Only one move. Interpose the knight. And I can now capture. Check. Only one legal move. King to e7. And can you find? queen takes e6 checkmate and this checkmating pattern where you check the king with a queen and the two squares uh, that the queen is not attacking the two squares that the king could go to if they are taken up by the king's own forces then that checkmating pattern is called the swallow's tail 
because it looks like the tail on the bird or swallow. Okay, so that is like the dream version of this opening. And now I'm going to finish this video off. And um, in the next video in this series, I'll be showing you all the different kind of openings and gambits and tricks that black can try to hit you with in order to challenge your queen's gambit setup so that they won't just get demolished like this so that is it for this video i hope you had a good time i hope you felt i hope you feel you learned something and i hope i will see you in the next